Thank you. Good afternoon. It is great to be back at Philanthropy New York for a field talk. I welcome Avila. Give her a Philanthropy New York welcome and greeting. Thank you very much, and it's great to be with you this afternoon. It's great to be uh, in New York and to meet a uh, philanthropist from New York. And I want to talk this afternoon very briefly about community philanthropy. And you're probably saying, why would somebody from outside North America be speaking about community philanthropy? Only last year, you celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Cleveland Foundation, the first community foundation uh, in the world. However, over the last 25 years, 74% of new community foundations, women's funds, place-based funders have actually been set up outside North America. And that's what I want to talk about. Because in many ways, it has been a bit of a hidden story, what's been going on in the, in the global south and indeed in Eastern Europe and across Russia. And the interesting thing about community foundations, women's funds outside North America is yes, they are funders, Yes, they mobilize resources like, like community foundations do here, but they also do other things because their contexts are different. And here, for example, the director of the Kenya Community Development Foundation talks about essentially turning the development paradigm on its head. So when it came to actually sinking wells in, in, in villages to get fresh water in Kenya, they didn't call in the experts, or the engineers. They went first to the local communities. And he actually sort of said, what do you want? Where should we locate them? And hey, would you like to come along and give, not money, but, but, but your, your, your skills, uh, your, your volunteer help in terms of sinking these wells? So in effect, it wasn't just the output that they were looking at. It was the process of getting to the output. And that meant that there actually was much more of a sense of local ownership and sustainability in terms of that initiative. Meet the Dahlia Association, working in a very difficult situation across rural villages in Palestine. What they said was, really the need in Palestine is to re-energize local communities by affording them a sense of trust and respect. We've got these billions of dollars coming in in international aid, but actually local villages don't have a say in many cases in how that's spent. So what they did was they had a Village Decides program. Do you know how much money was involved? $12,000. But the villagers voted on what projects should be supported. And the villagers set up their own Transparency and Accountability Committee. I met them eight weeks ago. And if you have Grandma Saida on your Accountability Committee, you don't have any problems. Because she wants to know where every dollar went. Move to Haiti. Again, here we see the, the, the Community Foundation for Haiti, which has been working to come together over the last four years. And why? Because of the millions, billions probably again, of dollars that went into Haiti since, since the, the disaster there. Recent research says that 0.6% was actually decided on by local people. So what the Community Foundation, the people involved in the Community Foundation for Haiti was saying is, we're going to spend time going out to actually encourage participation. So the whole series have had 20 local cons consultations across the island and, and, and involve people in deci deciding the priorities. And actually, what local people said to them was, look, we don't actually really want the money at this stage. We want the skills and the sense of involvement so we can decide how this thing is going to work. Back to my own area, Northern Ireland. That's one of our peace walls that divides <coughs> Catholic, Republican, and, and Protestant Unionist communities. We still have 47 of them dividing Belfast, notwithstanding our peace process. The Community Foundation for Northern Ireland structured itself to work in a divided society. Half the board was always from one community, the other half from the other community, to ensure that there was a reflection of the diversity and differences to actually build solidarity and trust. But it went further than that. Whenever we had the ceasefires, we actually invited in the five paramilitary organizations to meet in the Community Foundation. And they have been meeting there for 15 years on a regular basis, not just to advise on the allocation of monies for the reintegration of ex-political prisoners, 
but also to provide trust building, to provide back channel communications when necessary. And currently the Community Foundation is moving to set up a human rights fund to ensure that the human rights dimension of dealing with the legacy of the violence is not overlooked. Another difficult area, South Sinai. Very recent Community Foundation in South Sinai is set up in 2011, initially looking at the enhancing the income generation potential of traditional uh, crafts and, and husbandry with the mainly Bedouin community, very disadvantaged community in South Sinai. But after a period when there was confidence built, local people came along to that community foundation and said, that's great. But hey, we, we, what we really want is we want discussion about democracy and how the, the electoral system works. Because it turned out that 80% of that community were not registered to vote. So what the community foundation did was they trained local people to act as facilitators so that there would be acceptability of, uh, uh, and openness and discussion. And after a period of six months, there was actually Bedouin people coming forward to stand for election and actually won elect elected positions uh, in, 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 in South Sinai. And again, like your community foundations or your women's funds here, asset building is extremely important. But again, quite often it's done somewhat differently. This is a picture of a residential centre, a conference centre built outside Kathmandu by Tiwa, the Women's Fund. And happily, it, it, it wasn't affected by the recent earthquake. And indeed, Tiwa has been working uh, with, the, with a rural, mainly rural-based women's groups that it has uh, on its grantee list to actually rebuild uh, their communities. But Tiwa said, right, what we need again is this sense of local ownership. So all their grant making is funded locally by 3,000 local donors across Kathmandu. The centre was a partnership with international donors, but again, the grant making is bringing in uh, local donors. So what we're talking about here really is a very dynamic movement that ducks and weaves, and it always reminds me actually of, of Ace, one of Aesop's fables about the oak and the reeds, that you get the big institutions that are the oaks, but when the storm comes along, and actually blows down the oak, it's the reeds that survive. For my mind, these, these organizations, and some of them are very small, they're the reeds of actually community philanthropy that can bend and that, and that can respond to, to, local, to local needs. And what the Global Fund for Community Foundations does, it gives small grants to help organizational development, but it also actually brings people together. This was a picture of a number of community uh, foundation and women's fund people coming together to exchange peer learning. And it was absolutely magical about seeing someone from the Guangdong Harmony Foundation in South China talking to someone from the Monte Verde Community Foundation or someone from the Ulundu Community Foundation in, in Zimbabwe talking to somebody from Chuman in Siberia. It actually overcame all those divisions when you actually got people saying, we share some of these issues and, and, we, and we want to share how we go forward. But the other aspect of, of, of peer learning, which, which I think is really important, is the ability to actually communicate between that sort of horizontal uh, learning across uh, communities and with donors like yourselves and others across the global north. And one of the more recent developments has been the establishment of the Global Alliance for Community Philanthropy, that indeed Ford and others are part of, to actually sort of say, well, is there also learning that we can take from what's happening and, and at these, this local level. The Dalai Lama said at one point, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. <laughs> I actually take this along with Gandhi's view that it's not what you give, but how you give it as my two mantras. Because actually, if we are really talking about trying to make sense of some of these macro policies that, that we're involved in and some of our macro visions in terms of how we go forward, we need to ground it in the local, because otherwise we're, going to, we're not going to bring people with us. We're not going to be relevant in terms of what's happening in these different societies. So if you want to know any more about the local connections uh, and, uh, and, and what's going on, both thematically, because one of the things we're looking at is how community philanthropy can actually deliver on specific thematic interests, be it human rights or be it managing uh, uh, rebuilding after disasters, 
but also regionally, then please do feel free to get in touch. Thank you.